Hi guys, welcome to number 18 of our research reviews with I Measure You. This week we are fortunate enough to have Jackie Alderson with us. So let's get jump straight into it. Jackie, I think if you don't mind, let's just discuss your background, how you came to be a researcher and the prominent researcher you are and where you are in your current career. Sure. Um, pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation, uh, especially to all of the, uh, the team that have asked me to talk today. So uh, my research has been a, a strange one, really, my, my journey to become a researcher. Um, lots of people don't know I started in, a, in an arts degree um, a million years ago. Uh, it probably makes me, I think, today a much better scientist because I did philosophy and anthropology and psychology and all those sorts of things. I only did that for about 18 months, though, and, or years or something like that, uh, and then decided that probably I should get a little bit more serious with the things that I loved, um, which was a, a little bit directed by the fact that I'd actually suffered a, a, a pretty severe knee injury and uh, I loved sport and then all of a sudden couldn't play any sport. And so at that point, I decided to uh, move to Western Australia, study sports science and, uh, and study the thing that, I, that uh, got me into sports science, really. So I did an undergraduate degree. I was lucky enough to get a PhD scholarship after an honours, which I did with Bruce Elliott. I did my honours with Bruce at the University of Western Australia. And then I did my PhD in knee injuries, of all things. Um, and I had, a, I think, by the end of my knee, but my PhD, I had about eight knee surgeries. So it was time to, uh, on, one, on one knee. And uh, at that stage, I, never, I was a bit surprised I continued to study knee injuries because I'd had a gut full of them by the end of that. Um, and I really was very, very I, w I strongly considered going on to physiotherapy after that, to be honest. And uh, Bruce Elliott convinced me not to do that. He said that that would be a waste and... Uh, convinced me to take a teaching position at the University of Western Australia. So much of my early career, I did a large amount of uh, teaching, undergraduate teaching. But I, of, of course, was lucky enough to be in one of the world's first uh, sports biomechanics groups. And so I walked into a fairly ready-made group, which is, we talked uh, off air just a little bit earlier about my publication history. And um, much of that is the good fortune of inheriting and working in an established bio sports bio biomechanics group. And I ended up with, I think I'd supervised my first PhD to, uh, before I finished my own. So I inherited lots of students and uh, much of my publication history uh, is owed to the debt of the work of many, many of those students since that time. So I became a full-time biomechanist at the University of Western Australia, technically in 2002, though I didn't finish my PhD, that delayed it significantly. I think it took me seven or eight years to finish my PhD, which I finished in 2005. And I've been researching on, on campus at UWA ever since. That, that, Jackie, just touching on the, you delaying your, your PhD quickly. Um, I mean, you see a lot of full-time PhDs advertised three or four years. Do you actually think it benefited you to delay the PhD to kind of expand your your knowledge of the industry, your, your um, ability to teach and, and learn from different people over a longer period of time? I think it did, actually. Um, uh, the institution I work at now, while a great one, uh, and it's one of what we call the group of eight, similar to the Russell Group in, uh, in the UK, but it actually takes in a huge number of, in fact, I think one of the highest, uh, it, certainly a few years ago, it was one of the highest levels of uh, uh, straight out of high school students in the sense that we didn't we don't actually have very many mature age entry or what we call group two entry and so what that generally means is we see PhDs coming in quite young um, with without a huge amount of life experience so one of the things and I've done this regularly uh, supervised many PhDs across the years now but one of the things I do do is encourage, uh, particularly after honours years, it's a little bit different in Australia compared to, say, UK or Europe. Our honours year is essentially a master's, two-year master's condensed into one. You can only be invited to do it if you get a certain grade in your undergraduate. Um, and then if you get a first-class honours, you can go straight to a PhD. But by definition, that actually means uh, we can have, in real terms, we could have PhD students starting at the age of uh, 21, um, which is very, very young. Um, and I normally will 
suggest that they go away and experience some of the world, certainly work in the industry. Um, and even if it's, I mean, they do have to do large amounts of PRAC placement, but PRAC is still not like working out in the real world with people. And I think, I think there's a huge benefit. I did a number of things in that interim period as well. I did things like um, established a metabolic centre was one of the, we were with a colleague um, we were one of the first people when everyone thought we were a bit crazy to do basal to do metabolic testing and resting metabolic rate testing when everyone thought it was just a bit of quackery. Now you see it everywhere. Um, uh, that was but that was that was the dark days when I was putting my toe into exercise physiology. I don't think I've ever told anyone that story actually. <laughs> so I did that. I ran a sports science, um, sports science, advanced sports science services centre with someone as well and we established that and we had some, um, it wasn't really a dynamometry per se, but it was hydraulic based equipment. And so we did all of this sort of stuff that would give us some talk readings and all those sorts of things. Um, and I think that early experience may certainly makes you view the world differently i think it's very dangerous to just go straight through as a student all the way through that's not to i've obviously had some students that have done that but some of the best phds that i've supervised have definitely been from people who've come back to study following experience out in the real world great and so i mean speaking about some of that research so you've got quite a, a long history and just for everyone listening you heard it here first about the metabolic testing many years ago. <laughs> so, I mean, one study that I found highly fascinating, I think it is a great piece of research I'd like to dive into a little bit, was your paper with Dr. Weir, I believe you supervised a PhD, if I'm not mistaken. Last year, I think it was published on the two-year biomechanically informed um, ACL paper. Can, so, can you talk me through that? How did that start from, you know, from its infancy to completion? What, what was the process during that paper? It was very long, actually, and in fact, it was longer to try and get that paper published than it, it was to actually uh, collect that data, even though that data was collected over a four year period, believe it or not. Um, that was a, a, I'm really, that's one of the uh, patches of work in my career that I'm really proud of actually. And that much of that is due to the people that worked on that in particular, Gillian, Dr. Weir is, um, who's now at uh, UMass or actually just joined the Yankees. So she's moving across to wow. the Yankees now. Um, uh, still keeping regular touch and the, what she did in that in that particular PhD was great. So, but it came about serendipitously. I happened to be at a party, believe it or not, and uh, uh, I bumped into a former a friend who was a former hockey roo. I mean, if you follow field hockey, any most people in Australia would know the Australian women's uh, hockey uh, hockey team under Rick Charlesworth is in fact uh, the most successful Australian team sports team of any discipline in the history of Australian sport. Um, and they're a fantastic group. And uh, I was talking to Kate Starr, who was uh, then retired, but working with the Australian women's team. And it was just in the lead up to the London Olympics. I think it was they'd suffered five ACL injuries within a 12 month period in, uh, leading up. And she sort of said, oh, do you think we can do anything? And I said, well, of course we can. Um, so let's see what we can do. And then we ended up working really closely with the medical staff. Other people in that project were John Donnelly, Cyril John Donnelly, uh, Bruce Elliott, but we worked really closely with the medical staff and the coaching staff. Um, in some ways, it was, you know, this beautiful uh, symphony of terribleness for the Australian hockey team, but also as a researcher, all of a sudden you had a high-performance team, a national high-performing team, that had a problem and then they needed you. Uh, and often where, where they're begging to get access to athletes and where they're trying to convince them that we can contribute and help um, injury prevention, and sometimes we're seen as a bit of a pest or what we do isn't going to generate anything positive for a team. Um, but they sort of needed us and we, of course, needed them. And so there was this beautiful symbiosis of, okay, we, this could be mutually beneficial. Let's see what we can do. So it was really the first and only time in my entire career that we, everyone at the table, and I've worked in clinical biomechanics. So I actually started in clinical gait and uh, working with kids with cerebral palsy, et cetera. But it really was the first time in my career that every stakeholder came to the table and we were all moving towards the same thing. Um, which was, can we reduce ACL injuries? Coaches were on board. They gave us time out of the schedule. 
uh, medical team were on board, we were able to do this, athletes were clearly on board. And we just over a six year period, I think it was, we provided this 3D biomech sidestepping uh, servicing to them. Um, and in the time that we worked with there, and then we used the biomechanical pillars of injury prevention. Um, so the things that we knew from a biomechanical perspective would contribute to the increased loading at the knee that is a, that we believed is associated from literature, from our work and from other people's work that were associated with increased risk. And we basically worked with the SNC team and the medical staff to create this injury prevention program that they would do. Initially, they did it for nine weeks really intensively and they gave us time out of the schedule. Then we did a maintenance program over the next couple of years. Uh, that The Australian hockey team didn't have one ACL, non-contact ACL injury in the next four years. Um, and I think that's the, that's the best proof. It's not that I can provide numbers to say that knee moments were reduced or I think the best the best evidence or the proof is in the pudding really so um and that all was done by Gillian Weir as part of her PhD and she did a fabulous fabulous job Kate Starr then took it upon herself and many people now in Australia Kate now actually works for the Australian rules football women's uh, Fremantle Dockers and she's in and actually the men's team have implemented that same program as well so it's kind of gone out now which is really good but we had a huge amount of trouble getting that published David. If you don't mind me asking, Jack, why? What was the, What were the issues? Were there, um, you know, what were the issues? If you don't, if you're allowed to disclose them, yeah, of course. So if you think about, um, so one of the first things reviewers will look at is obviously your research design. But as everyone on this podcast listening and the two gentlemen I'm speaking to right now know that when you work with elite sporting teams, you don't get to sort of split them into control groups and non and uh, intervention groups for a whole range of reasons. So we weren't able to have a control group for that particular project because it, it, A, we had the entire population of the elite performers in Australia and not only were, were there not enough of them to split them to, for statistical power to have different interventions anyway, or can, but um, it would have been unethical to do so, to withhold that treatment from that uh, half of the team in order to make it uh, statistically and, and methodologically palatable to a reviewer. So purely because we continue to not have a control group for that particular study, we had huge, it just would get rejected outright. So we had a little, we had a drink, I think. We had a toast when we finally managed to get it published. And I think it was the Translational Journal of the American College of Sports Medicine or something like that. It was a, it was a translation journal that finally um, agreed to publish the work because it was really important work for those people trying to do intervention at the coalface with um, not just elite athletes, but community athletes as well. It's, um, I could talk about that particular pro project for, uh, for the rest of the podcast, but it would bore everyone. But, but um, I, I was really, I'm really proud of that. And Gillian um, in particular did a fantastic job. It's, um, it's unbelievable, isn't it? Because we, we hear all the time how, how the research being published isn't, um, appropriate for elite sport and we don't have access to, to elite athletes and then when you do have access to elite athletes you're hit with the fact that it hasn't got enough scientific rigor it's it's really really um frustrating i imagine but i mean it, it, it's a great bit of research and you mentioned you were you were really proud of it and i think ultimately all researchers should strive to to make a difference with what they're publishing and you you clearly have done with with that particular project in terms of your other research, Jackie, I know that there's an abundance we could talk about. Are there any other specific projects, papers that really stand out to you in the sense of you being incredibly proud of, of your work and the impact that it's had? Uh, yeah, probably so. And I think Jamie will talk about this a little bit. Some of the early modelling work that we did um, in the upper limb for, for cricket, I'm, I'm proud of. Um, but that's very early, and that's probably I'm proud of that probably for different reasons. In the sense, it was very early in my career, and you start you. It was the first time I actually saw something that I did get applied in a really important way uh, with respect to sort of you know the impact of whether you were modelling something correctly or not determines someone's professional career. Um, so that was really uh, interesting, and I think the more the recent work that I'm really quite proud of is the work. I think really it's the it was some of the it really I think. 
it would be fair to say it's easily uh, some of the first work in the world that's managed to compile biomechanics databases for machine learning approaches and it took us many years to compile that work but um, it's worked by Bill Johnson uh, who's now with uh, the Houston Astros as a data scientist. Um, he was a PhD student who, who recently finished about a year, 18 months ago. Um, but that work I'm, I'm particularly proud of as well, only because it was, it, it was it, I think it's groundbreaking in the sense it, that we went in a direction that no other people were sort of doing, but we were lucky enough to have a large data set because of the history at UWA. But also uh, I'm proud of the way that Bill went about conducting that because he didn't come from a heavily strong uh, sports science background. He was actually an engineer. So there was lots of um, hurdles, but he also brought unique skill sets that we wouldn't normally find in sports science. So that particular work is the genesis really of um, the new direction that I find myself on now, but it actually had been in, in the pipeline for a good eight to 10 years. I'd been working with the computer science department to be able to get to that point. Well, yeah, and then just touch on that research. As I said before the call, I'll be a bit selfish because I'm a cricketer myself and that's uh, where my passion leads down. So you, you have done a bit of work with uh, a case study with Murray Lutheran and I mean, who's recognized as one of the greatest bowlers of all time. Yeah. How, and I've seen a couple of pictures on social media you, with IMUs on the wrists and things like that. So what, ha what were you looking for, A, and B, how was it working with, you know, those types of, those types of people who are the best of their craft of arguably all time? Yeah, sure. Um, so the cricket work started, uh, it really came to UWA because of the history that Bruce Elliott and Daryl Foster and a range of people had early in the, seven, in the 70s with uh, back injury work and Dennis Lilly and some people like that. So the first time that uh, Murley was called for throwing, um, no one really knew what to do. And so there was this, I was, a, I think the first time I was an honours student, so I'm going to give away my age now, but um, that was like back in 1995. So I met him in 1995 when he first, yeah, stop smiling, Dan. Um, uh, he came <laughs> he came to uh, UWA uh, and D David Lloyd was uh, on staff at UWA then as well, Professor David Lloyd, and it was really like, can you can you use a Vicon system? Because we we realised fairly quickly, we tried to use the pink system from memory. I remember digitising through the night for a couple of days, as all good and dutiful students do, um, for Bruce and David, and realising that it was simply not possible to use a video-based system for what we needed for him, which was, you know, it's part of the cause now. We all know this, but at the time we were, we were just learning okay he's got all of these uh rather strange congenital deformities at the elbow i think he was in about i measured this uh, an anthropometrist measured this at like i think his carry angle so his elbow abduct, abduct, abduction was about I think, nearly 40 degrees and he was in fixed flexion of 42 degrees so you're trying to you're trying to create a model to measure that that using you know pseudo 3d at the time which was 2d video um, so we, I remember this, we had a 50 hertz, uh, seven camera Vicon system, I think, from memory, and we tried to write a model for it and uh, realised, so really what we'd, we'd done is reverse fit a, a clinical gate system to try and capture upper limb cricket bowling. And uh, it, did, it did the job just, uh, but then obviously we saw him five times over the next 15 years many calls after that and from it was actually at that time um actually that's a lie i think i was a phd early phd student so now i'm getting now i'm really showing my age i was working with tor Bizier and uh he was a phd student or just come out um uh finished his phd was still maybe a one year postdoc at uw for a little while and we'd written some lower limb modeling and then tor which i think tor had left for stanford and we realized we needed to write some stuff for the upper limb which then for the next 12 years, really, 15 years, uh, we've been we've been refining that upper limb modelling. I probably had three or four students just working upper limb modelling in cricket uh, for cricket application, but they did things like we used MRIs to validate shoulder joint centre locations, um, did a lot of elbow modelling work. Um, and that uh, probably should have, you know, if I reflect on that earlier conversation, I'm pretty proud of that level of work as well because for nearly... 
from from 1995 really through to 2012 or 14 we uh, ran sort of a, a legal action testing for the International Cricket Council based on all of the work that was done established initially by David um, and I was a minion at the time but then over the course of four or five PhDs following that so that was really good fun Neuralee was great um, stopped doing that work in about 2012-14 it became relatively punitive I think and what we really needed to do was move out of the out of the lab and into the field so had been working in inertial sensor trying to basically do a similar thing with inertial sensors um, and have been tried most company sensors um, and recently in De like December last year uh, had Merely come back out to Western Australia to test. I've worked for about six years now with Andrea Chirati and Valentina Camamilla on, on the actual protocols and methods that we could use to uh, do this properly for cricket. So it's one thing to calculate a joint angle. It's another thing using an IMU to make it anatomically relevant and relevant enough to be able to record to the fidelity we need for cricket bowling. Um, so that, you know, I think if we were just doing it for generic sort of elbow angles, it would have, we solved it a long time ago. But we've certainly, we understand exactly what we need to do. We've known that for some time now. Um, we've got the process and the procedure completely under control. We've got some limitations still with hardware um, because we're talking about really high, you know, high accelerations and gyro speeds that we need, et cetera. So we're still trying to to uh, hit the sweet spot with the hardware, but the modelling process and what we need to do with that, we have uh, definitely uh, had that ready to go and ready to roll out for probably two years, two and a half years now. Nice, fascinating work. And Jackie, just just talking about the direction in which you're you're headed. Obviously, you mentioned um, you touched on on machine learning and the the computer science aspect of 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 your role what, what are you what are you moving into now which direction are you are you heading so probably for the last five or six years um, I've strongly I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit embarrassed to say I don't really think I've collected since Jill's hockey project I'm not sure I've collected data in the lab uh, using 3d motion capture other than to validate the machine learning uh, predictions that we've been making so we now we collated uh, uh, maybe a, our 30 year history historical motion capture database and have about half a million motion capture trials. Uh, it's still a bit messy, but we've been able to extract all the sidestepping data from that and a whole range of things. So I wouldn't say it's perfectly categorised and it's, the data hygiene is still a little bit suspicious, but certainly for running, walking and sidestepping, we've, we've got that. You can imagine how much other sort of data, can't think of too many things we haven't collected in the lab. Um, including lizards and a whole range of, you know, different animal work of colleagues, etc. cetera. Um, but the collation of that has allowed us to then use machine learning, you know, deep learning methods and, you know, convol convolutional neural networks and a whole range of different things to be able to really what I, my driver now is to get us out of the lab and into the field, but to do that without losing the resolution of data that we're able to collect in a lab. And for mine at the moment, and it has been for a number of years, the best way to do that is to leverage what we have because we have together as a community, we have a huge amount of existing biomechanics data. To a certain extent, we, need to, we don't need to collect too much more. We don't need to collect unless it's a certain particular pathology or something that's a unique use case. But if, you, if we considered as a community how much running data we would have, or how much sidestepping data that we would have. We have huge amounts. Um, and from if we're asking more generic questions about energy cost or a whole range of different things, like you know, these, these more variables that are fairly consistent and able to be um, estimated, I think we can use machine learning tools to predict those things. And so that's what I've been working on in the last four or five years. Um, and then previous to that, working with computer science, just to, the, the team in computer science, they're fantastic, but it took me even a couple of years to work out, you know, the nomenclature of what we were talking about with each other. Their version of the kinematic model is very different to mine. It took me two years to work out that we weren't talking about the same thing, which is why we were both getting frustrated with each other. But it's such a fascinating area, and I think it's definitely the future 
of biomechanics. We do it now. We can do things like we use 3D body scans and we can, can, we, can uh, we merge it with DEXA, DEXA scans and we can predict uh, segmental body segment inertial parameters and body fat from that information, fair, you know, with a good 90%, if not higher accuracy, depending on the cohort. Um, we use it to predict. Just uh, two weeks ago, we, could, we were predicting ground reaction forces from two-dimensional video with a 0.99R squared. Wow. So uh, that stuff we're validating at the moment. We've done that previously with Bill's work using IMUs. So IMUs are really nice to fine-tune between the two states between the lab and the field um, so the full markerless but we, we were leveraging off uh, IMU data in order to fine-tune that to get to the uh, really nice just straight to the video estimations um, I won't go into the you know the, the complexities of how we do it but I think that's exactly what you know, people can contact me if they want to really know and there's some some, some of our more recent papers easily give you the outline of that um, uh, but I think that that's definitively where the biomechanics space is going to move to over the next, you know, I think Scott Delp's lab put, um, put something out only in the last couple of weeks in exactly the same area um, out of Stanford. So personally, I think uh, it's going to be a race to who gets there first. I don't know if anyone's familiar with uh, Facebook's musculoskeletal uh, modelling group, but they're pretty impressive. So people are, people are racing. That's, that's pretty, I mean, I, you know, I'm, to be honest, I don't know if Dan is, I'm not too familiar with Facebook's musculoskeletal group, but it feels like they, they've got a, a hand in everything at the moment. Um, mm. And then on that topic, where next for Jackie Alderson? What, what's the next steps? Where's the, if you don't mind discussing that a bit, you know, where, where are you now, where are you going? Where's, where do you see your career going from here? No, which is, I just gave myself a fabulous segue, didn't I? Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> So uh, just last week, actually, I've, I'm taking a little bit of a sidestep and, uh, and while I still work in machine learning and I have students, for example, working in um, performance analytics um, and they're doing things like uh, looking at uh, statistics data from matches, possession data from matches and GPS tracking data and merging those two things to be able to predict events in games and do chains of events. So I have a couple of students working in that space at the moment. But really what we're trying to do, what I'm doing now is uh, just last week I uh, have moved into a new role, which is a, a just under a $5 million new funded centre here at UWA that sits in the law school. Um, it's called the Mindaroo Centre for uh, Tech and Policy. Or it's, I tell a lie, it's the Mindaroo Tech and Policy Lab. We decided to call it a lab. Um, and this was particularly because of, my, um, in some ways, my involvement in it as well. Uh, the lab itself is focused on sort of tackling lawlessness and uh, empowering workers and reimagining technology in the technology ecosystem, um, which sounds like quite a big remit. Um, but by lawlessness, they're really talking about there's no real jurisdiction in the world that has, whether you're talking about governments or um, institutions or policymakers, for example, legislation that are able to rein in those really big tech companies. Those tech companies now are more powerful than most nation states. Um, but the tech sector is, in fact, the only unregulated sector in the world. So if you think about pharma, it's regulated. If you think about building and construction, everything is regulated. So this exceptionalism just for that group um, is not in the interests of the community, it's not in the interest of the public. It's certainly not in the interest of companies like I Measure You, um, where they can they, they have no real recourse and they're not protected. Um, so I fall into the reimagine technology um, stream, where my job will be to look at how we might consider making technology and make use cases of technology in the public interest. Um, and one of our core streams is uh, we'll have a sports theme. So we're going to be looking at data in sport um, and the use of data in sport, the privacy implications, but also the health implications, how we use that data. Um, I measure you data, for example, is a fabulous example of that kind of data that's collected on mass. I'm not saying we shouldn't collect it, but I think perhaps we should have larger conversations about the rights of athletes in the collection of that data, the rights of companies in the collection of that data, and then the rights of professional organisations. Um, so the first one of the first jobs we um, and projects we're working on is convening a 
uh, a pro is a is a, certainly a roundtable and a discussion uh, with people from the Australian Academy of Science and the Australian Academy of Law, with specialists in uh, the sports field and people that work in data, um, to talk to us about what are the current key critical issues that affect that, and athletes will be involved in that as well. So. Um, Probably, maybe it's a sign of you getting a bit old and you just, I can't be in the lab anymore. It's time to do something a little bit more with a bit of an overview and I'll leave some of the hard work and the development work in the more uh, granular biomechanics data back to the people, the new people that are coming along. So it's time for me to not hang up my boots, but maybe step aside and do something a little bit different for a while. That's, that's really awesome. And congratulations again for the, for the new role. Um, Thank you. Jackie, if, if people want to, to find out a little bit more about the, the work you're embarking on or even talk to you about um, previous research, how are, they, how are they best reaching out to you? Uh, the best way to reach out to me uh, is obviously just via email. Um, I did have a Twitter account. I was having some trouble with some trolls on Twitter, so I, accident, I deactivated it to... to so they'd go away for a little while and um, unfortunately not realising that after 30 days you lose your account. So I'll start my account again and we'll do that because I very much enjoy being on Twitter. So I'll re return to the fold now that uh, I think uh, I shouldn't have said terrible things about Trump during a TEDx talk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so... Uh, I, I have actually just re-established my Twitter account, but I'm always available via email. I'm certainly happy, um, some, depending on the, um, you know, the time of year, et cetera, but I will always get back to you. Um, I'm certainly happy to talk about... A, a lot of students uh, uh, contact me for general advice, and I'm always happy to do that about, um, in, you know, if people are considering uh, careers in research, et cetera. So if anyone has any questions, they can feel free to um, drop, me, drop me an email. Perfect. Last question from me, and this, I, I hope you don't miss anyone out and I hope no one would take it personally. But one thing I would like to ask is, because you've arguably quite blazed the trail in your endeavours, uh, you know, from the metabolic um, stuff all the way through to now. Off the top of your head, can you, you know, for everyone listening, a couple of female, could be researchers, it could be in the tech space, you know, female, you know, individuals that have really impressed you that you think people should keep an eye on and that, because we obviously it's a it's an important topic in today's society, with a lot of um, not communities but sectors being almost gated, and you know there's a lot of females blazing trails, and we think it's really important to you know shine a light there. So is there anyone that you feel you know off the top of your head that you know follow X Y Z? You know these are the people to look out for. There's some fabulous people around, of course, and I actually appreciate that's a lovely uh, question, Jamie, and not one I've ever been asked. Um, so thank thank you for it. Um, lots of great people. Sophia Nymphias, although she has her own almost sub following anyway on Twitter, so she doesn't need a shout out, but she's very impressive. Um, uh, Gillian, I have to talk about Gillian. I think she's fantastic. Um, there are people, uh, Katshin in the UK, there are lots of really, really great women, uh, certainly biomechanists about uh, tech. From tech, you have a look at the work of Julia Powell. She's the director of the lab that I do if you're interested in just tech law and governance, um, particularly if you're involved in health and wearables. Her specialisation uh, is, in fact, uh, uh, health uh, law, and she was working at The Guardian, one of the people that broke the Google DeepMind NHS story. So as my co-director of the lab, I must give her a shout out, but um, if you're interested in following the philosophy around tech law, follow her. Uh, in Australia, there's, oh God, uh, Lisa Phillips, we, who is, goes a little bit under the radar, um, but she's the National Biomechanics Lead for bio, in Biomechanics in Australia for the Australian Institute of Sport and NIN System. Um, I, she's a fantastic uh, researcher, uh, an individual. There's clearly people through, through the United States as well. Um, uh, with no forewarning, I'm sure I can list another 30 who I haven't thought of straight away. But you know, there's all, and then there's the those that everyone knows in, knows in the states, like uh, uh, Irene McClay Davis and Lynn Snyder Macro, and not, the list goes on. Fantastic, and we we obviously encourage the the listeners to to go and take a look at those those individuals because clearly they're doing some some fantastic work, and they. They deserve all of the exposure that, that they can get. So I think, Jame, unless you've got any further questions. Nope, nothing from me, Dan. 
No, so, Jackie, is there, is there anything that you wanted to, to kind of add? Nothing at all other than to wish everyone well, be safe. I hope they're, and they love they're both of themselves and their loved ones and friends and families are well in this rather strange time in the world. No, perfect. And we, we echo that sentiment. And the last thing to say, Jackie, is thank you very much for your time. Um, we really do appreciate it. Um, and for, for all of those listening in, um, we'll be back soon with, a, with another research review. If you want to learn more about what I measure you do and, and IMU STEP in particular, please check out our website and have a look at the IMU Academy. There's a lot of good stuff going on there all the time. But um, no, thanks again, Jackie. We'll, we'll speak to everybody soon.